so much that he's even saying, do you know what? If me being cut off from Jesus will save them, I'll do that. Do you love your neighbour? Do you love your neighbour? He, does he love him enough? Right? Does he love him enough to, to lend them his lawnmower if they need it? Or to let them park across his driveway? Does he love them that much? Does he love them enough to take a casserole round when they're a little bit in need? Does he love them enough to tell them about God's love and Christ's sacrifice? Even if it means he might be rejected and laughed at? Does he love them that much? Does he love them enough to share the gospel even if it means being beaten up and put in prison? Does he? Those of you who know your Bibles should be going, yeah, he does. As we read the book of Acts, we see that Paul loves his people so much that he will travel around, great risk to himself, being attacked, killed, just to share the good news of Jesus. First to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Paul's love is so great that he's prepared to tell us. Right? And write it down. Right? If I could be forever kept, if I could be cut off from Jesus so that my people could be saved, then I'll do it. Do you love your neighbour? Do you love them to that extent? Do I love them to that extent? That I'd rather be cursed than cut off from Christ. Whoa. You see, Paul understood that if you reject Jesus as the Messiah, that is actually the end result. That's what happens. If you reject Jesus as the Messiah, you will actually end up being cursed and cut off from Christ, from God. That's what the Bible shows us. Right? The place is called hell. And what he's saying is that many of his Jewish brothers and sisters had done exactly that. They, and in fact the vast majority of Jews since then and now, have rejected the Messiah. They have. They've rejected Jesus. And because of that rejection, they're cursed and cut off from God. And it wasn't just Paul's idea, this. I right, don't just think, oh, it's just Paul on one of his things. No, Jesus says it. All right? Jesus says it in Matthew 8, verse 11. He says this, And I tell you this, many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at the feast of the kingdom of heaven. What a picture. Like many Gentiles will come from the east and the west, sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at the feast of the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was actually prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think that's another description of curse that's come off, isn't it? And that's why Paul is filled with bitter sorrow, unending grief for his neighbours. His love for them was so great that he didn't want to see his brothers and sisters cursed and cut off. He didn't want to see that. And that's what God was kind of staring at me this week. Do I have that same love for my neighbour? Do I? For those living on my street? For those living in my town? In fact, it's for a nation, for my nation. Do I have that love? Do you have that love? But then it got me wondering. It got me wondering. Hold on a minute. Hold on, hold on. Hadn't God made promises to Israel? Huh. Hadn't God made promises to Israel? Promises made to Abraham? Promises made to Moses and the people of Israel as they left Egypt. Promises of adoption as children, didn't he? Didn't he make that promise? Promises that they have a land for them to live in. This promised land. Promises that they would forever be his people. He made those kind of promises, didn't he? 
further thinking, has God not kept his promises? Has God not kept his promises? I thought they were the chosen people, a holy nation who had promises from God. Has God broken his promise? Well, then, and if God has perhaps broken his promise to Israel, is there a chance he might break his promises to me? Stay with me. Stay with me. All right, stay with me. I'm just making you think. We'll get to a good place. All right, just stay with me. You know, promises, we only have to go back one chapter, chapter 8. There are so many promises in chapter 8. All right, promises of no condemnation. Promises of a spirit, the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling in us because we're adopted children. Promises of sharing in his glory, of new bodies of resurrection. Promises that all things are going to work for the good of those who love him. Promises that nothing can separate. You see, promise after promise after promise. But if God's broken promise with Israel, would he break promise with me? How can we be confident that the promises we have in Jesus will come through? And Paul's kind of response is it, there in verse um, 6, it starts in verse 6 really. His, his response is this. Right? He even asks the question that I was asking myself really. This is the question. Well then, he says, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? So I'm on the same ground. Paul asks the same question. Okay? Has God failed? Has he failed to fulfill the promises to Israel? What a terrible thought that God has failed to keep his promises. But Paul very quickly answers his own question. No. No. Has God failed? No. And then he explains why. For not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Just because all right, many Jews have rejected Jesus and are cursed and cut off, that in itself does not mean God has failed to keep his promise. Why? Because not all who are born Jewish are actually members of God's people. Not all Israelites are true Israel. Not all biological descendants of Abraham are true descendants. How can this be? How can that be? It seems complicated, doesn't it? Well, Paul explains it. Verse 7. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Now Abraham had other children too. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. See, being born a biological um, son of Abraham didn't ensure you were a child of God. Abraham had a number of children. Not only one, Isaac was counted as a child of the promise. Only one. So Paul is clear. God has not failed to keep his promises because not all Jews belong to true Israel. Paul is showing us that right from the beginning, when he called Abraham and promised that he would be a father to a family larger than the stars in the sky, more numerous than the grains of sand on the beach. Right? When he was doing that, right from that moment, God was actually narrowing down who the promise of God refers to. He was actually narrowing it down. He said, it's Isaac, not this man. It's Jacob, not Esau. <coughs> and amongst those, the whole Jewish nation, as Jesus declared, Many Israelites will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cursed, come off. Why would that happen? Because they've rejected Jesus. Because they've rejected the Messiah, the Son of God. That's why they're cursed and cut off. For those who accept Jesus, they are called to be children of the promise. Called to be descendants of Abraham. Right? 
children of God. Let's go back to Paul. Paul says he's willing to be cursed instead of his brothers and sisters. He says he's willing to be cut off from Christ. Can you imagine anything worse? He's willing to be cut off from Christ because of his love for his fellow Jews. But could that actually ever really happen to Paul? Could it ever happen that he could be cut off, cursed from Christ? Could you or I, who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord, could we ever be cursed and cut off? The promise God has made with his people in Christ can never be broken. Whether you're a Jewish Christian, a British Christian, an Indian Christian, even a South African Christian, whatever you might be in your, your ethnic nationality, as Paul says at the end of Romans 8, nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love revealed in Jesus. Nothing. Nothing can separate us. So although Paul says he wishes for his nation's sake to be cut off, in reality, that could never happen. Never. It could never happen. And if you are in Christ, hear this now, neither can you ever be cut. That could be a hard video. It could be. We're going to keep working on it. I'm going to get you there. Come on. That is just phenomenal. Right? That's absolutely amazing. Nothing in all creation. So, are you part of creation? Yeah. Right. Nothing you can do to cut yourself off. <coughs> Right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, yes, sir. All right. What about what about the demons and Satan? Are they part of creation? Yeah. They can't separate me from the love of Jesus. I'm in Christ. You're in Christ. Nothing can separate you. Oh, come on. <laughs> ah. But you know what? There was one. He was cut off. There was one. Although perfect in every way, he went to the cross as a criminal, went to his death, was cursed by his fellow Jews, experienced the wrath of God, separation from his father. He was cursed, cut off for you and for me. For all who would call on his name and be saved, that we would become children of the promise, children of God. You see, when God makes a promise, he isn't just letting us know what he knows is going to happen because he's outside time and can see what happened. Let me say that again. When God makes a promise, it isn't a, well, I can see the end, so I know what's going to happen, so I can make a promise. No. When God makes a promise, he then acts to ensure the promise comes true. He acts. He doesn't just say, oh yeah, I know the end, so I can tell you, yeah, it's going to be okay. No, when he promises, he says, right, I'm going to do everything to ensure that is fulfilled. That's how God works. So we can know nothing can separate us. Although Paul kind of said, I wish I could, because he's trying to make a point, and I love him so much, but even then he would know nothing could separate him. Because he just written it just a few verses earlier. So what about the Jews today? Right? Those living in Israel, those living throughout the world, are they cursed and cut off? <coughs> well, they are if they haven't accepted Jesus as Messiah. If they haven't accepted Jesus as Christ, because being a member of the family of God is not linked to your physical birth. It's not. It's not linked to whether you've got Jewish parents or not. It's not even linked to a piece of land in the Middle East. Because it's not physical birth that saves you. It's spiritual rebirth. Right, Jack read last week from Nicodemus as part of our worship. All right? Nicodemus, this devout Jew, a respected leader. All right? um, and, and John 3, we read this encounter Jesus has with him. And Jesus says to him, and let, he's, a, he's a Jew that does everything right. Oh, he's up there. He's up there with the Jewish leaders. Right? And Jesus says, 
Unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're born again. It's not because you've been born as a Jew. You've got to be born again. At the end of it. Alright? Oh no, I'll come back to that in a second. See, because there's a danger that we think there are two paths to God. We can have a danger we think there are two paths to God. There's one path for the Jewish nation and there's one path for the Gentiles. And we think there's two ways. Ethnicity, salvation in Jesus. No. Paul's saying that's not how it is. That's not how it is. I need new birth in Christ. You need new birth in Christ. People from South Africa need new birth in Christ. People from Israel need new birth in Christ. It is the only way to God. There is only one way to enter the kingdom of heaven. Only one way to be saved. And that's a new birth in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus concludes his conversation with Nicodemus with these words. He says this, verse 14. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, must be lifted up as being nailed to a cross. Okay? So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. You see? And this was God's plan all along. The eternal Son, Jesus, come into earth to sacrifice his life as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. It was not plan B. It wasn't plan B. It wasn't that God had a plan A with Israel. Oh, it all went pear-shaped. Oh, it's all gone, what am I going to do? There's God in heaven going, what are we doing? It's not going well. Israel have messed it up. What's we? Oh, okay. Okay, Jesus, yeah. Okay, bring reinforcements. You'll have to go. No. It was plan A all along that Jesus would come. Right there at the beginning, in the garden, Adam and Eve. Right? Adam and Eve. All right, they're together in the garden with God. And they mess up. They mess up. And then they come under the curse. The whole of creation comes under this curse, doesn't it? But one of the curses is, all right, it's about man, about woman, about serpent. And then, it, and then God says to Eve, your seed will crush the serpent's head. Right there in chapter 3 of Genesis. Who's the seed of Eve? Jesus. Her descendant, you can track it through. Her descendant, Jesus, will crush Satan's head. And he did it with the cross. You see, it was plan A all along. All along. But what about Israel then? That nation. Are they not the chosen nation, beloved by God, the ones who in all the Old Testament promises are for? Well, what Paul is saying in chapter 9 here, he's showing us that right from the beginning, God was choosing, hear that word? God was choosing who would be part of true Israel, the true people of God. It wasn't because of who their father or mother were, because both Jacob and Esau had the same mother and dad. They were twins, if you didn't know, in the womb together. And while they were still in the womb, God said, Jacob, not Esau. God chose. Was it because Jacob had done anything? No, he was still in the womb. Was it because he's going to have an amazing, amazing character? No, he was deceitful. It wasn't anything he'd done. It wasn't anything he was going to be. It's just God chose. God chose. Chose. Who oh, asked that kind of question next? Verse 14. Aren't we saying then that God's unfair? Because he chose Jacob and not Esau. He chose Isaac, not Ishmael. He chose. Yeah, is, is, God not, is God unfair? Paul says. No, of course not. And then he reminds us what he said to what God said to Moses. I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it's God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. The mercy of God is a gift. It's a gift that he gives us. Jesus spoke of this when he said in, in John 15, verse 16, he said this, You didn't choose me. I 
verse 65. The people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. Paul's own life demonstrates this perfectly, doesn't it? He was a Jew, a devout, highly educated, top there, right? Keeping all the law, doing amazing stuff. Right? He was a Jew of beyond Jews. And when we first meet him in Acts, what's he doing? Right? He's going around trying to arrest Christians. In fact, he's arresting them, he's putting them in prison, he even oversees executions. This is, this is Paul, right? This is who he is. And then he goes on the road, right, to go and arrest more Christians in Damascus. And while he's on the road, he meets the risen Jesus. And his life is transformed. Did Paul do anything to deserve to meet Jesus on that road? No. Nothing. Was his character the kind of character going, yeah, 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 Jesus wants those kind of people. Were his actions the kind of actions you go, ah, oh, yeah, we're looking for someone to follow Jesus. Paul's the guy, he's the guy. Killing Christians. Nothing he did, nothing of who he was. God chose Paul for Jesus. He chose him for Jesus. And what are we reading about? We're reading about the sovereignty of God. God chooses to show mercy on whom he chooses to show mercy. And that's why Paul is so eager to see his Jewish brothers and sisters repent and turn to Jesus. They too, like all humanity, can only enter the kingdom of God, not because of their ethnic heritage, not because of the place of birth, not because of the passport they might have, but through faith in Jesus. And it isn't that the church has replaced Israel like a plan B. And you'll hear people talk about that. They call it replacement theology. That's not what it is. We're not replacing Israel. We're not fulfilling all God's promises. This was his plan A right from the beginning. Right? Because God said he's going to have a people across every tribe and tongue. All nations are going to come to the mountain of the Lord. It's not a surprise that the Christians in Jerusalem started spreading out and telling everybody in the world about Jesus. It wasn't that God was just going to redeem a small patch of land in the Middle East, but that all creation would be made new. So has God broken his promises? No. Entry into the family. The only way to be adopted into the eternal family of God is through faith in Christ. So what's my part to play then? Well, Jesus tells us very simply. Right? John 6, verse 29. Jesus says, this is the only work God wants from you. This is the only work God wants from you and me. Look at it. Believe in the one he has sent. That's it. Believe in the one he has sent. In Jesus. So Paul said, if you don't believe in the one you sent, you're cursed and cursed. But if you do believe in the one you sent, all the promises, all the promises right through the whole of Scripture are for hell. <laughs> do you love your neighbour? Do you love your neighbour like Paul? When you realise, like Jacob was chosen in the womb, over Esau. God's chosen you to know the love of God. I suppose you could say, well, I don't want to work well then to make God's chosen me, I'm all right, I'm in. I think God's saying, hey, he should move you. He should move you beyond moving, beyond anything you've ever known before to say, I just want you to know the love of God too. Sandra was telling me the other day, you know, she'd say, I've Cousin, wasn't it? Yeah. And just God gave her words to say to her cousin. Just to explain the gospel, explain who Jesus is. So beautiful. Because her heart is for him to know Jesus too before he dies of cancer. It moves us, doesn't it? But we know that God has loved us so much that he gave his son to die. Oh, but you want to tell us. You want to share this good news. Do you know how they know? 
they know by the love we have for one another. Yes, they preached. The early church preached. Of course they did. Yes, they taught. But what transformed the Roman world wasn't the preaching and the teaching. Do you know what it was? Is they saw a community that looked so different from the community that they were in. So different. Right? It was so radically different from what everybody else was doing in the Roman world when they looked upon the Christians and go, what is going on here? And it was as they looked in and saw the love they had for one another. Transformation. Why can we love? Because Christ has loved us. Because God has loved us. And so we love one another. Oh, I encourage you to know the joy, the absolute assurance of your salvation in Christ. Nothing will separate you from his love. Nothing.